Good morning, everyone. Hi, welcome. My name is Leanne Erdberg. I'm the director of our Countering Violent Extremism program here at the United States Institute of Peace, and I am delighted to welcome you here today. For those of you who are new to the Institute, we were founded by members of Congress who were also veterans of World War II, and they had returned from the battlefield convinced that the U.S. needed greater capacities to wage peace as effectively as we wage war. It was a bipartisan effort, drawing broad support from both parties, and in 1984, President Reagan signed into law the United States Institute of Peace, an independent, nonpartisan national institute charged with the mission of preventing, mitigating, and resolving violent conflict abroad. We fulfill that mission by linking training and analysis, research and policy, and by working with local partners on the ground in conflict zones around the world. We have offices in Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan, Tunisia and Nigeria, just to name a few. And when it comes to violent extremism, we know that significant knowledge gaps still exist and they continue to pose obstacles. To help address these gaps, USIP is proud to host the Resolve Network, which stands for Researching Solutions to Violent Extremism. It's a global consortium of researchers and research organizations committed to more rigor, more empiricism, and more understanding of both violent extremism and the sources of resilience. We've seen through our work and through our research that the rise, spread, and evolution of violent extremism is one of the most challenging issues we face today, especially as it interacts with existing conflicts or creates new ones or further damages already fragile contexts. And deadly violent extremism is on many people's minds today following the terrible mass shootings over the weekend in Texas and Ohio. I'm still at a loss for words for the horrors that loved ones and victims are feeling right now, the newly empty sides of the bed and the people who are rereading that text message over and over again. Those that are in hospitals right now asking, why did I live and others died? This weekend added more families and friends to the list of the forever injured, forever scarred, forever harmed by violence. And this is a type of grief and a type of violence that exists in way too many countries around the world today. In fact, as found by a USIP-led task force on extremism in fragile states, worldwide attacks have increased fivefold since the year 2001, and extremist groups have spread to 19 out of 45 countries in the Middle East, the Horn of Africa, and the Sahel, sowing chaos and undermining already challenging circumstances. Here, at an institute committed to the notion that peace is possible, we want to help uncover new ways to do better at addressing some of the most wicked problems surrounding violent extremism. So today, we are tackling the problem of how governments and communities are grappling with what to do with their citizens who traveled to the so-called Islamic State and other conflicts when they return home. With the territorial caliphate extinguished, more than 100 countries could face the task of not only reintegrating their citizens, perhaps tens and thousands in total, but also preparing their communities for a future with living with people next door. Some who were part of these violent extremist groups will face trial, and some will face incarceration, but not all. Some will eventually be released from prison, and many others will reintegrate directly back into communities. So local communities need to be prepared, and society has a public safety imperative to pursue rehabilitation and reconciliation. People need processes to enable them to abandon their violent attitudes and behaviors, but communities also need avenues to enable social cohesion and to avoid further violence, revenge, and re-radicalization. Yet we lack the language in our public discourse to even talk about people who are disengaging from violent extremism. As far as most of us are concerned, once a terrorist, forever a terrorist. And while the radicalization, um, while the radicalization is a very complex process, there are many, many different paths to violent extremism. Inherently, it's social in nature. So disengagement and rehabilitation also need to address social factors too, to not only help somebody disengage from their violent attitudes and behavior, but also rebuild the bonds between that person and society and generate a new sense of belonging. Currently, 
we scholars, media, government, community members can be unintentionally using language that underscores trauma, anger, and fear. We reinforce a person's identity as a terrorist or a fighter, as a jihadi or an ISIS bride, and it may contribute to a self-fulfilling prophecy. Luckily, for those of us who study violence and conflict, we are not the first discipline to work with highly stigmatized populations. In public health and criminal justice, in social work, practitioners have learned to leverage language as a tool to shape attitudes and behaviors, to reduce the burden of stigma, and to ease open spaces for engagement. And in these spaces, communities can be presented with opportunities for social learning, for rehumanization, and reconciliation. Let me be clear, I'm not Pollyannish about the real violent risks that violent extremist group and people who are a part of them pose. And this conversation does not take away from the need for clear justice and accountability mechanisms for those who have committed atrocities and other crimes or enables others to do so. This is not about forgiveness or absolution. But once justice systems meet out their sentences, prison time has been served, or those who did not commit crimes were never charged, this need to call a spade a spade must grapple with the other reality of how we enable communities new to the front line to get reintegration and reconciliation right. Because all of our safety and security depends on it. This is a tall order which is why I am delighted today to be joined by four incredible experts who will help us further unlock and unleash new avenues for addressing this challenge. Today's event, for a quick rundown, I'm going to introduce each speaker individually. They'll give about a 15-minute or so presentation. I'll then introduce the next speaker, and they will present. When everybody's finished presenting, we'll move to a moderated question and answer session. I'll take questions from the audience in groups of three. We're also accepting questions live online on Twitter and from our overflow rooms here at the US Institute of Peace. With that, I'm going to start introducing our speakers and get today going. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Arie Kruglansky. Dr. Kruglansky is a social psychologist with extensive research experience on the dynamics of violent radicalization. His model, drawing from human needs for respect and significance, is outlined in his latest book from Oxford University Press, The Three Pillars of Radicalization, Needs, Narratives, and Networks. Dr. Kruglansky is going to provide foundational context on the social psychological drivers of violent radicalization with attention on the role of marginalization, group dynamics, significance, and respect. With that, please help me welcome Dr. Kruglansky. Thank you very, very much, Leanne. Good morning to, to all. Um, I'm very honored and pleased to be here. Thanks to USIP for uh, arranging this event, organizing this event, and thanks for Dian, uh, Michael, and Chris for inviting me. Um, as you all know, radicalization that progresses into violent extremism uh, has been and continues to be a major issue for uh, nations around the world. Al uh, ISIS uh, has lost its caliphate, but it's far from being defeated and neither is Al-Qaeda, and they, they continue uh, to launch attacks and attract followers and inspire uh, individuals to join them uh, all over the world. Hundreds of attacks uh, in different parts of the planet. So the question is, how do we understand this global threat and what can we do about it? Uh, in today's talk, I'd like to present a psychological perspective on this issue that I believe to be important. Um, many uh, psychological phenomena, many political phenomena that uh, shape history and determine the fate of nations are rooted in human psychology. Macro-level phenomena such as poverty, poor education, or oppression uh, occasionally contribute to radicalization Sometimes they matter less and sometimes they matter not at all. Why? Because they matter only when they activate, when they are in circumstances that activate uh, the psychological mechanisms that promote radicalization. Psychology is the, is the basic discipline that uh, addresses uh, psych uh, radicalization. Uh, and uh, most importantly, 
if we understand this mechanism, we can not only understand it, but also prevent radicalization the world over. Over the last decade, several decades actually, we have been carrying out field research uh, in various parts of the globe uh, with uh, empirical research with hundreds or if not thousands of extremists and, and uh, terrorists in jails and other locations. And uh, on the basis of that empirical work, we have developed an integrative model, a model that on the one hand capitalizes on insights, important insights, of outstanding social scientists from various uh, social science disciplines. And uh, th that um, model uh, integrates in the sense of showing how their diverse insights combine into an uh, understanding of a process whereby radicalization and violent extremism take place. Uh, we suggest, in fact, that three parameters of the process are critical. They've been, they've been um, emphasized singly by different models. We combine them together. And the three uh, parameters are individual's motivations, the need component, the first N, the narrative that tells individuals how to satisfy their motivations, uh, and the network that validates the narrative and dispenses rewards for those who serve uh, their needs in terms of uh, violent extremism. Let me say a few words about these three ends. Uh, the need is critical. Uh, after all, radicalization is located at the individual. It's the individual who decides to uh, don a suicide belt, to pick up a weapon, to travel thousands of miles in order to join the fight and kill people, whoever, uh, wherever they might be. Uh, therefore, a, a very important question that was posed by terrorism researchers was what is the motivation? Why do they do that? What, what uh, makes them... Uh, take those risks, make those sacrifices, risk life and limb uh, in order to uh, join uh, the fight. And uh, terrorism researchers have provided an answer in terms of a list of different motivations or motivational cocktail, as uh, Diego Gambetta uh, put it. Uh, for example, uh, the perks of afterlife has been one motivation. They do it in order to uh, enjoy the perks of afterlife. Uh, or they do it because of their uh, uh, adulation and, and commitment to the leader. Or they do it uh, because of feminism, to show that women can also do it. Or they do it because of vengeance. And all of these uh, motivations uh, have their place and, and are uh, important uh, in specific cases. But I submit to you that underlying all of these motivations, there is one universal need, and this is the need to matter and to be significant, to have respect, both self-respect and respect from others in one's community. Now, this quest for significance, uh, how we call it, uh, like with all motivations, isn't active at all times. We do not quest for significance 24-7. So the question is, how is this quest uh, uh, activated? And the, the simple answer is it's activated when significance acquires special value. Uh, and it acquires special value primarily when one lo loses significance, when one experiences humiliation, uh, disempowerment, disenfranchisement, discrimination. Uh, and w this can be uh, one's own failures, one's own uh, a lack of luck, one's own uh, circumstances that, uh, that uh, promote one's suffering. For example, stigma attached to Palestinian women who are accused of uh, uh, extramarital affairs or uh, who are uh, infertile uh, or disfigured by fire. So it can be a very personal thing having nothing to do with uh, in international conflict. But it can also be something that has to do with one's social identity. When your group, 
religious group, ethnic group, uh, racial group, is discriminated, humiliated, you feel the, this uh, discrimination as your own thing, and you're then motivated to uh, restore your significance, and that, uh, that humiliation, that discrimination, provides an opportunity to great significance gain, to become a hero, a martyr for the group that was discriminated against, that was humiliated, that experiences the grievance. Now, uh, the quest for significance is a universal human need. As a, a Jean Vanier put it, all of us have secret desire to be seen as saints, heroes, and martyrs. The quest for significance uh, is something that all of us have. A little baby quest for attention, because otherwise it will not survive. Adult human beings also vie for recognition. Nobody wants to feel disrespected. How then uh, we acquire respect? How do, 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 uh, we require this sense of significance? The simple answer is that we acquire significance through living up to our values. It's the values that trickle down to those who serve them and, and lend them significance. And of course, the values vary by uh, different cultures and different groups. What uh, the narrative element of uh, our 3N network uh, does, it ties violence to the, the values that lend one significance. It shows how to attain significance through violence. It tells you to gain significance in this particular circumstances, you have to join the fight. You have to kill other people. You have to be ready to take risk, sacrifice yourself, maybe die on altar of the cause. And that gives you significance. So uh, the narrative function is very important. We all crave significance. We are not all terrorists. We are not all violent extremists. We have other avenues to significance. We serve other values. But if you're exposed to a narrative that tells you you have been insulted, you have been uh, disempowered, your, your group has been uh, slighted and, 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 and insulted, and you have to stand up for the group, join the fight, and, uh, and uh, uh, protect the, the, the group's glory and, and significance, at that point you, you'll uh, become a violent extremist. And finally, the third N is the network. Why the network? Network is important because we are social beings. The network of people uh, who we respect, our in-group, so to speak, defines for us what is the social reality, what is real, and it validates the narrative. Uh, without the social network, we would not know that actually uh, you have to fight, it's important to fight. The network tells you, yes, it is what you need to do. Uh, agreement of the network validates the narrative, and beyond validation, it dispenses rewards. It admires people who serve the value through violence and through uh, extremism. It tells you that, you know, uh, you are a hero, you are a martyr, you're going to be forever engraved in the collective memory of the group, you may go to paradise, and so forth. What kind of networks? What are we talking about? The, the networks vary uh, uh, widely from proximal face-to-face -face networks of the kind that Mark Sageman made famous, a bunch of guys that get together and incite each other to action, all the way to uh, virtual networks, networks uh, on the internet that are particularly <laughs> influential these days, fori uh, uh, that people attend. So you don't have to be in, in physical presence of, of these networks. Uh, you know that if you carry out a shooting, if you, if you ram uh, your vehicle into people and kill them, you know that if you pick up an ax or a knife and kill uh, alleged uh, enemies of your group, you're going to be appreciated. So it's a kind of implicit uh, network that uh, you, you do not have to uh, be in, in physical presence of. Now, what is uh, unique about our model and how this, does it relate to alternative conceptualizations? After all, 
social scientist. Can I have some water? Social scientists have been studying violent extremism for, for many decades, uh, and they've provided very important insights. I think that what's important about uh, our model is that it brings these insights together into a unified functional uh, portrayal of, uh, of uh, uh, violent extremism. S some people uh, in some models, uh, through light, illuminated one part of the elephant. Our aspiration is to uh, embrace the entire elephant and provide uh, uh, the reasons why the different parts work together. Let me illustrate that by examining some very important contributions in this domain. Ted Kerr's famous book, uh, 1970, Why Men Rebel, emphasizes the idea of uh, relative deprivation. Relative deprivation uh, is the, the, the idea that your group does not receive its just desserts, uh, it's uh, uh, slighted, it's uh, uh, discriminated in comparison to other groups. And of course, this touches on the quest for significance. It is a loss of significance, but there are other ways of losing significance, as I mentioned, even uh, um, uh, sources of uh, significance loss that are personally based, your personal failures, and we have plenty of evidence that personal failure leads people to embrace collective causes in the interest, in the service of uh, regaining their significance. Uh, of course, uh, Ted Gould doesn't uh, uh, emphasize the, the aspects of narrative, the ideology, and he does not uh, emphasize the aspect of the network. So he does uh, identify an important element, but I think that uh, uh, those other parameters are also important and we bring them together. Uh, people talk about macro factors, economists and others, uh, poverty, oppression, poor education, and they all uh, came to the conclusion that neither of these alone promotes violent extremism. In terms of our model, these factors also address the loss of significance. If you're poor, uh, if you're oppressed, uh, you, you do not feel very good. You feel insignificant. You feel you do not matter. But of course, not all poor people and all oppressed people become violent extremism. You need those other ingredients to the mixture. You need to have the narrative and you have to have the group, the social movement that supports uh, the narrative in order for this to uh, combine into, into this uh, combustive uh, uh, mixture that pr uh, creates violent extremism. Scott Atran, my friend and a great colleague, uh, emphasized the issue of sacred values as, and devoted actors as a, a, an important ingredient in violent extremism. Yes, definitely, but sacred values are important because they allow people to serve them and therefore become significant. It all comes to the individual and their uh, motivations, and the motivation for significance is, is served wonderfully if you uh, sacrifice your life, take risks, uh, are ready to die on altar of sacred values. So sacred values are important in conjunction with those other elements. Uh, Mark Sageman, of course, made famous the issue of networks, and networks are important. Again, why networks are important? As I said, they are important because they validate the narrative uh, and, and they, they uh, dispense rewards. They pronounce you a martyr or a hero. What about deradicalization? Deradicalization is, in some sense, a reversal of radicalization. So the same three elements that promote radicalization, if you reverse them, uh, they promote the radicalization. Uh, for example, the importance of narrative, the importance of counter messaging is, is, is uh, of paramount uh, significance. Uh, you, you have to counter the idea that uh, Islam is uh, uh, served by jihad against infidels. You have to uh, promote the idea that uh, there is a tolerance in Islam and, and uh, the, the ideology is actually a misinterpretation of what uh, the prophet uh, intended. Uh, you've got to have 
a, a counter narrative. We are sentient beings. We listen to reason, and narratives are uh, what provides justification, what provides uh, the rationale for our actions. So uh, the narrative is important in the radicalization. Uh, the uh, network is very important in the radicalization. Uh, we have recently completed another book on uh, German neo-Nazis and the, those who left the movement very often left because they connected to an alternative network. They meet somebody, they meet a friend, a romantic relation that draws them back to the mainstream uh, ways of thinking. Uh, so the network important is very uh, important in promoting the radicalization. Finally, uh, reduction of the, of the dominance of the quest for significance, uh, activation of other needs, a need for love, need for relatedness, need for uh, having a career, having a life. Uh, and uh, nobody expressed it better than a, a, forum, a matter, a forum member of the a Basque terrorist organization, ETA, uh, who, who explained why he wants to deradicalize. And what he says is, you say to yourself the S word, <laughs> I better get myself a lie because time is running out. It's a matter of being that much older, and in my case, specifically of uh, wanting to get married. You are going on 40 years old, you're going to get married next year, and you say to yourself, well, S word, man, <laughs> I mean, at this stage of the game, to go packing a piece, that would be a bit because you just got to S, -man, S word. Well, we have got. All to live a bit. The other needs are activated. The need of uh, the quest for significance is reduced. Now, I mentioned uh, the empirical evidence on which our theorizing has been based, and uh, time is too short. I probably already exceeded my time. Uh, but I would like to share with you the story of one research project on the radicalization of uh, Tamil Tigers of Elam, the LTTE, Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam. You all know who they are. Uh, they waged a 30-year-long uh, uh, secession campaign to create an independent Tamil state. They were recognized as a terrorist, terrorist organization. Uh, they employed violent and brutal tactics, high-profile assassinations, suicide bombings, child abductions, use of civilians as human shields. Uh, they did a lot of damage. 100,000 uh, victims, civilian victims, over the course of 30 years, 50,000 uh, fighters killed. Huge devastation, one of the most vicious uh, terrorist organizations in the history of this phenomenon. They had their Air Force, uh, Air Tigers, they had their Navy, uh, Sea Tigers. Uh, in 2009, uh, more than 11,000 uh, Tamil Tigers surrendered to the Sri Lankan military after a bloody battle in which thousands of civilians lost their lives uh, in 2009. And the government at that point launched an effort to rehabilitate the surrendered terrorists. And they were placed into the radicalization facilities of different kinds. Uh, it was our great uh, luck to uh, be able to enter those facilities and carry out research on all the 11,000 uh, 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 extremists. This is... Uh, uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksa who was at that time uh, Secretary of Defense and uh, uh, he was the architect of uh, the demolition of the Tamil Tigers. Uh, the, the radicalization programs were adopted from the Saudi programs and other programs uh, that were launched to try to uh, distill the best elements of those programs. Uh, they had educational, vocational, psychological spiritual and recreational, cultural, fam family and community programs. Uh, and the idea was to equip the detainees with new capabilities to reintegrate into society uh, after release. Uh, these are some of the pictures of the programs. In terms of our uh, framework, 
The need was, had to do with respect and dignity. They were accorded really a respectful treatment. They were not even uh, referred to as detainees or as terrorists. They were called beneficiaries, and this was also adapted from the Saudi program. Uh, the narrative uh, was on the ineffectiveness of war and uh, emphasized the importance of tolerance and coexistence. And the network, there was extensive use of families and the community uh, integration uh, in order to, uh, to embed them in social support of their uh, changed attitudes. Uh, we were able to carry out res uh, controlled research on uh, close to 500 uh, that were uh, exposed to a, a full-fledged program of educational, vocational, psychosocial, uh, and so on. And we also had a control group. It was important to see whether this program is effective as opposed to individuals who are over the same time exposed to a much more limited uh, program. So this was our minimal treatment group. Uh, and we looked at it, uh, three waves of data uh, at uh, six months intervals. And as you can see, over, uh, over time, uh, the full treatment group, their radicalization that we measured in various ways, decreased significantly over the uh, minimal treatment group, which suggests that, uh, that th this particular program was effective. At the end of it, they were much less radicalized than uh, when they entered. And what is interesting for uh, all of us who are empirically minded, that the, uh, their attitudes toward the program was uh, related uh, positively to a reduction of extremism, and this was mediated by their uh, feeling significant in the program, feeling respected, feeling that they mattered, that they are cared for. Uh, what about long-term success? This was immediately after the end of, of the program. Does this uh, last? This is, this is the end. So we examined extreme attitudes uh, who are, uh, of beneficiaries who were released from the program. And again, the number of programs uh, that uh, they participated in was uh, negatively related to extremism, and this was mediated by significance. What's particularly interesting, that they were less extreme that, that a comparable sample of community Tamils who, who were never part of the uh, uh, LTT organization. Uh, and what is uh, a bit more troubling is that those of the Tamils who had uh, connections to their, to their network of, of uh, erstwhile comrades were, less, uh, were more extreme than those who did not. So uh, this is the community uh, and the Tamils who were uh, connected to, uh, to uh, former uh, members of the LTTE were a bit more extreme than those who were not. And also Tamils who were connected to the diaspora, who was radical, tended to be uh, more extreme than those uh, who had no connection to the diaspora. Uh, sorry about taking so long. Therefore, conclusions. Uh, I think that these results uh, offer a glimpse into the mechanism of the, the radicalization process. They support the 3N model, and they suggest that effective radicalization should utilize a multi-pronged approach that empowers the detainees uh, through reconnection with mainstream society, and uh, that remains on guard as to potential re-radicalization. In the same way as people radicalize, they can de-radicalize, and they can re-radicalize. The human mind is very malleable. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for a lot of information on uh, empirics as well as theory, and um, I hope that many others find that uh, they can learn even more about Dr. Kruglinski's work in his latest book. Um, next, please join me for a warm welcome for Shannon Foley Martinez. Uh, she's a former white supremacist who now helps others disengage from violent extremism by emphasizing empathy and compassion. She'll provide some remarks on the effect of stigma, the importance of empathy and belonging, and pro-social engagement in the rehabilitation process. Please join me in welcoming Shannon. Thank you all uh, so much for having me. 
I don't have a slideshow. <laughs> um, I want to just take a moment uh, to just honor uh, those who have died this week uh, at the hands of uh, people who uh, took the ideas uh, that they were wrestling with and looking through and uh, chose to enact catastrophic violence uh, as an expression of those ideas. There are lives that are irrevocably changed, lives that are lost. The timing uh, for this event uh, is pretty, pretty uncanny because we are currently engaged uh, inside this country in a discussion about the language that we use and whether or not that language holds power and whether or not language influences behavior. Pope John Paul II uh, had uh, a, a saying, uh, lex orendi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. Essentially what, how we pray is how we believe, is how we live. Uh, I've thought about this a lot over the years, uh, about that the words that, that we use uh, change our thoughts and how we think, and our thoughts then change how we live. In a perfect scenario, from this moment, not a single human would radicalize into violence-based ideology. If we had our way right now, perfect world, no one would take that trajectory. It still leaves a whole lot of people who are still currently in that movement or the, the whatever movement of choice, whatever expression of their violence-based ideology. The best scenario for uh, over this past week would be for uh, the young men involved to have turned away from their ideologies before they committed catastrophic acts of violence. But then where do they go? What do we do with them? And how do we treat them afterwards? From the time I was 15 until just about the time I was 20, uh, I was involved in the violent white supremacy movement. I had uh, a pretty dysfunctional childhood, uh, but not overtly abusive or anything like that. Pretty run-of-the-mill 1980s white middle-class dysfunction. At the age of 14, uh, as I was doing what most 14-year-olds do and grappling with my identity and who I was in the world and who I chose to be, I felt pretty certain that mainstream culture was never really going to be a place where I could posit my identity and gravitated towards uh, counterculture. The first place that I really looked, uh, one of my very first favorite books was actually the autobiography of Malcolm X. I loved the power uh, of the ideas and the revolutionary nature in which they were presented. I would end up going into uh, the, the, the punk movement. Uh, and then shortly after I was 14, uh, shortly uh, before I turned 15 years old, uh, I went to a party uh, where I was raped by two men because of my childhood, I knew that I couldn't tell my parents. I knew that they would blame me for having lied about where I was going and having been drinking at that party, um, that they would be more angry about that than upset that I had just been sexually assaulted. I took that trauma, shoved it down, became consumed with rage uh, over the, the course of about six months. The angriest people in the periphery of the subculture uh, where I existed were the neo-Nazi white supremacist skinheads. The rage that I felt resonated deeply with the rage that they felt. I spent more time with them. I started listening to white power music. It broke down the barriers for me of using racially charged language and introduced some of the ideology and some of the, some of the talking points of the movement uh, into my vernacular. I began to read some of the literature uh, that was a part of the movement. Over time, uh, I would have a complete 
and utter physical echo chamber that I lived in that was only about this movement from the time I woke up till the time I either went to sleep or passed out drunk at the end of the night. Very luckily, uh, I ended up not having a place to go at one point. I was uh, dating a young man who was in the army. Um, he was also a white supremacist skinhead. Um, he was in the army, he was in training, uh, and so I couldn't go live with him. And at that point, I didn't have anywhere else to go. Luckily for me, uh, his mom, who was a single mom and had three younger sons uh, besides him, said that I could go live with her. I'm pretty sure she knew uh, what our ideology was. Uh, she, it, even if she didn't, at the time, I looked very gruff that my external appearance mirrored the internal realities uh, of my life and I looked very angry, uh, carried myself with bravado uh, and really didn't take anyone's shit. S word. <laughs> hey, C-SPAN. <laughs> she chose to see past this vile and hate-filled creature that I'd become and chose instead to see a hurting and struggling young woman. She set some parameters uh, about you know, trying to get a job, helping her with stuff around the house, uh, and included me uh, in all of the day-to-day -day family uh, activities, going, taking uh, kids to Cub Scouts, throwing Frisbees, uh, reading the Chronicles of Narnia to the, to the boys at night. She created enough stability in my life that expanded the space around me so I could begin to shift and look uh, and examine how, where, I, where I was, how I had gotten there. The ideology for me actually was, uh, fell away relatively quickly uh, as I had this space and stability. One of the other very crucial things that I think she did for me is that she reconnected me with a sense of future. When you are living a hyper-violent, echo chamberic life, there is no future. There might be a future in terms of the movement or what you hope will come from your belief system, but in a personal sense, there is only right now and a couple minutes from now. She challenged me on, the, on ideas like, don't you want to go to college? Don't you want to make something with your life? Beyond just introducing those ideas, she tangibly connected me to the resources that I needed to make that happen. She didn't just say, hey, don't you want to go to college? She was like, let's find out information. Let's find addresses is before the internet. Let's find out how you can contact these schools. Let's take you to, to sit for your SATs. Here is a number two pencil in your hand. Get in my car. I'm driving you there. She didn't just introduce ideas to me. What I didn't know while I spent these five years uh, in the movement is that not only was I actively dehumanizing other people, but that in order to do that and maintain that viewpoint and way of living, that I also had become deeply dehumanized. I was much less than human. I actively had to work at seeing other human beings as not human in order to project all of the things and wretch that I felt inside out onto other people. I think one of the reasons that this woman was so uh, transformative in my life is because she initiated the process of rehumanizing me by choosing to first see me as a human with a broken and twisted need set that was being expressed in terrible ways, rather than just as an ideologue or as somebody that was not worth it. It is a hard sell to gather resources and to invest time and money into even discussions about reintegration of people from violence-based extremism. I had no idea um, 
that one of the main reactions uh, in most of the comment threads of anything that's ever out there uh, in the media or on the internet about me would be a challenge to the, the, the very idea that people can fundamentally transform their lives. When we are talking about reintegration, it is paramount to examine whether or not we genuinely believe that people can transform. The objections are, either I never really believed that in the first place, or I still believe it now. Both of which are categorically untrue. It was an ideology that I would have died for. I hoped I would die for it. My belief system is utterly transformed. I believe in the co-empowerment and genuine equity building of all human beings. Our first, that is the first focus we must have when we are talking about any sort of reintegration. Is it worth it? Are these resources really worth spending on these people that have chosen these terrible belief systems and put forth heinous actions a lot of time? I am a mom of seven children, ages almost 22 down to three years old. They are phenomenal human beings. They fight for equality and justice, uh, equity building in, in their lives on a daily basis. They will, they have certainly transformed my world. They transform the communities of which they are part on a daily basis. And I feel absolutely certain that they will have a piece uh, in transforming the world. I think it's worth it to invest resources. If we look at things from a restorative justice point of view, and instead of just seeing the bad actions of one person, which they are, I hold personal responsibility for the choices that I made and the things that I did. We don't always do a good job talking about that. We talk about people falling down rabbit holes, sliding down pipelines, getting caught up in, in some way that releases them from personal responsibility, and I believe that to be a mistake in terminology. It is important that I accept responsibility because it's the only way to get towards making ongoing meaningful amends. I first have to say, I did this. I take responsibility and I am sorry. How do I make amends? However, when we talk about that, um, I, I so resonated with, uh, with what you had said. Uh, the way that I frame it is that we all have a basic need set uh, beyond food, you know, beyond food, shelter, clothing. And the way that I see it is that we all, have a, we all have the needs to give love and be loved, to feel truly seen and truly heard, and to feel like we have a meaningful connection with something greater than ourselves. Every single person that I have ever worked with and helped disengage from violence-based extremism, that this essential need set was broken and those brokennesses were compounded by multitudinous factors. From a restorative justice point of view, we have to see that bringing people back into the fold doesn't just help that individual, but it helps the entire network. We have to see that even though the actions are the responsibility of one person, that the ecosystem involves us all. Terrorists still have come from a family. They still have lived in communities. There is many layers of fracturing of those three basic needs that have led to their trajectory towards an immersed in violence. 
when we when people leave and we are trying to reintegrate them back into society in more pro-social ways, it helps heal us all. It heals the broken fabric that was part of the trajectory inwards. When we devote resources to healing those among us, we all become stronger for it. I can leave my finger broken and I can still get through life, probably with just the use of my other fingers, but how much stronger will my hand be if all of my digits are well and, and thriving? Jihadi bride. Let's talk about that just for a second. I am a female. I'm a female who became a violent white supremacist. There was a sense in which I found twisted sexual empowerment in my position inside a movement that uh, is based on dehumanization and objectification of people perceived as weaker. Women definitely fit in that category inside that belief system. On the outside, I wasn't really super successful uh, with boys and, and, uh, and dating and stuff, but inside I could pretty much go out with whoever I wanted because I was one of only a few women. Because sexual abuse was, uh, as sexual assault was part of, uh, part of my trajectory inward, um, it felt very much like sexual empowerment. I didn't know that at the time. I was just, you know, I was just doing what I was doing. But there was more to it than that. I was an active participant in my own radicalization, that I continued to amplify my willingness to use violence uh, and willingness to take risks. I was not a passive agent who was simply the, the arm candy, <laughs> the skinhead arm candy of someone else in the movement. When we use words uh, like jihadi bride, that we remove the sense of agency and that quest for significance um, that, that we just heard about. We say, well, yeah, but you're, we're, re we're actually reinforcing a lot of the viewpoints um, that exist with that. We remove also the ability for someone to take full responsibility, come to terms with their actions, which is a crucial part of, of reintegrating us into society. One last challenge uh, that I will mention is that in terms of the modern world, there are entire radicalized trajectories that exist nowhere except online. There are people who have stories of going into the movement in these I thought, you know, thought places and thought spaces and you know that when we talk about movement, particularly in terms of uh, the far right, alt right, white nationalist spheres, um, it's very much a leaderless resistance. There's very much they're they're the and there are very overlapping ideologies. Uh, I believe that we will see ideologies get more and more convoluted and enmeshed uh, over the next several years. Uh, it will be harder to pinpoint a single uh, ideology which looks like what we used to know it was. But these trajectories don't really exist anywhere outside of the internet. There's no actions taken. I mean, maybe they have conversations in real life with other people where they are, you know, where you bring your, your ideology there, but there, the echo chamber is, is completely digital. This is, going, this is a, a challenge for us to figure out how to navigate those spaces and how do we address people um, and how do we treat their trajectories into, uh, and then hopefully, out of uh, these violence-based ideologies. When they have not traveled across the world, and yet it's still a multinational network, uh, 
because it's the internet. It's everywhere. Do we treat them as though they are the same or different from people living this out in the physical space? Do we offer the same sorts of services? Do we prosecute them the same way? Do we hold them accountable the same way? I don't know that I have answers, <laughs> but I do think that this, uh, that there is very much a trend towards, you know, like even just like a virtual caliphate or, you know, in, in conjunction with like the physical space. Because obviously the most catastrophic thing is when that digital world leaks out and becomes catastrophic violence and action like we have seen over and over again. With that, um, I will turn the mic back over. Uh, but all of you who have the influence to do so, uh, I just, whenever you're, whenever you're challenged about programs, talking about reintroduction and uh, helping former uh, violent extremists, please remember my face. Please remember my story. Please remember the value that my life has now. If I had never been given that chance, I would never be able to be here and I would never be able to spend the rest of the breaths of my life doing as much good as I possibly can. Thanks, y'all. Shannon, thank you so much, and thank you for reminding us of the empathy and compassion necessary to really accept the humanity in all of us, and thank you. Uh, please allow me to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Paul Thibodeau is a cognitive psychologist who's an expert on the ways in which language influences cognition. He will present on the cognitive power of language, framing, metaphors, and how they shape perceptions, generate empathy, and reduce stigma. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. If my slideshow pops up here in a second. Okay. So um, I'm a psychologist of language, and I'm generally interested in the ways in which um, we use language to think about complex problems. I'm going to start with kind of an obvious and, and somewhat silly point, and that's just that solving big problems is really hard. So how do we fight world hunger? How can we fix a broken educational system? How can we, uh, or what can we do about a crime epidemic? And what does, uh, when does language marginalize people? These are all big, important questions. They're nuanced. There's no magic bullet solution to any of them. But as a society, we're tasked with solving these kinds of problems. And, um, in my work, I'm really interested in the metaphors and narratives that, um, that are embedded in these kinds of questions and that are embedded in the ways that we think about these problems. So when we ask the question, how do we fight world hunger, we're positioning world hunger as an enemy in a war that we have to defeat. When we're fixing a broken educational system, we're implicitly or explicitly thinking about the educational system as a machine or a vehicle that, uh, that we can just fix. Um, when we talk about a crime epidemic, we're talking about crime as a virus. And when we're talking about marginalizing people, we might be thinking about sort of people on a page. Some people are in the middle, some people are on the outside. So um, language is an important window on the world. In particular, when we're talking about big picture um, socio-political issues. Those are issues that we have some direct perceptual experience with. We can see depictions of world hunger. We can um, see depictions of crime. But, um, but those kinds of issues are not the same as um, a concept of a bird, for example, or a concept of a tree. 
we can go outside and see trees and birds and hear them and experience them directly. And with these other more abstract, complex socio-political issues, um, most of the information that we get about those issues is through language, reading the newspaper, hearing other people talk about them. So language is a primary and, and critical source of information about the world. And, um, and one way of thinking about the way that language works is that it just sort of describes the world, um, describes our thoughts. It's a, it's a tool for communication. And, um, and a follow-up question might be, well, does it shape the way that we think about the world? Does it shape our thoughts? And, um, and if so, how? And so I'm just going to talk through a few experiments um, quickly that, um, that illustrate the power of language to shape the way that we see the world. Um, early work on this question was done by Elizabeth Loftus and, and Palmer in the 70s. And in this experiment, um, participants watched a video of a car crash. And then they were asked to estimate the speed of the cars that got into the car crash. And they varied the um, verb that they used to ask the question. So um, one group of participants was asked about how fast were the cars going when they smashed each other. And other participants were asked that same question, but with um, the verb collided with instead of smashed, or bumped into, or hit, or contacted. And so there's variability here in the emotional valence in the and sort of the vividness of these verbs. And there's a corresponding um, sort of variability in the speed estimates that people are giving. So when a really vivid verb like smashed is used, people give a high speed estimate. And when a more um, neutral verb like contacted is used, people give a lower speed estimate. All the participants watched the same video. Um, and at some level, these questions, these verbs are all asking the same thing. You know, reflect on what you saw and just give us an estimate. But there's a dramatic difference in the estimates that people give. In my own work, I'm really interested in the power of metaphor to shape the way that we think about complex problems. So I um, present people with narratives like this, where, um, where people are exposed to one of two different metaphors. And, um, and most of the information in this report is the same, but there's a different metaphorical frame. So participants will read something like crime as a beast or virus ravaging the city of Addison. Five years ago, Addison was in good shape with no obvious vulnerabilities. Unfortunately, in the past five years, the city's defense systems have weakened and the city has succumbed to crime. Today, there are more than 55,000 criminal incidents a year up by more than 10,000 per year. There's a worry that if the city does not regain its strength soon, even more serious problems may start to develop. So participants read one of the two versions of the report, either the beast version or the virus version. And then they're asked a simple question. In your opinion, what does Addison need to do to reduce crime? And we've done this experiment with a, with a free response um, format. Um, that's how we started doing the experiment. And um, people would write things like, well, law enforcement should be stricter and the justice system harsher. And things like study the causes of crime and implement strategies to address the causes. And so when we were first starting to do this work, we were just looking through these responses and two big categories emerged. So some people were emphasizing more enforcement oriented um, solutions and some people were emphasizing more social reform-oriented solutions. And so we would code people's responses into these categories. And then we would look at and see whether um, people who read the virus version of the report would give different responses, um, different types of responses than people who read the beast version. And we found that they did. So people who um, read that crime is a beast would tend to emphasize enforcement-oriented solutions to crime, increase the police force, um, lengthen prison sentences. And people who read the virus version um, would give relatively um, more social reform-oriented responses on average. So fix the educational system, create jobs for people. Um, and 
And so, and this was a pretty dramatic effect. One word um, difference in a crime report that had mostly the same information across conditions was leading to a 20 point shift in, um, in the kinds of suggestions that people were making. We also followed up um, using slightly different methods where people would evaluate uh, specific policies as opposed to just responding freely. So maybe the metaphors would make something come to mind more easily in a free response format, but maybe it wasn't really making people think differently and, and maybe it wouldn't affect how people would actually evaluate these, these policies that we provided. So we would provide some policies that were enforcement oriented and some policies that were reform oriented. Um, people would read the same report, either the virus version or the beast version, and then they would pick um, one of these as, um, as their preferred method for solving crime. And, um, and using this multiple choice um, format, evaluating actual policies, we see the same effect. So the first two sets of bars are from experiments with a free response format, and it's just showing, showing the proportion of enforcement-oriented responses. So people who read the beast version of the report are more enforcement oriented than people who read the virus version of the report. People who read the virus version are more reform oriented. Those are the only two categories that we're really coding. And, um, and we're seeing this effect using a variety of different methods. Another um, line of work that is related um, that I want to talk about briefly, and then I'll unpack some of the cognitive mechanisms that I think are at play is some work I've done on obesity and, um, and looking at narratives for obesity. Um, in the context of obesity, I'm going to use the term narrative rather than metaphor, although I think they're very similar, and we can talk about um, some of the similarities and differences. But there's um, a variety of very salient, popular sort of narratives about the causes of obesity. And some focus on the individual and limitations of an individual. So um, talking about being overweight as sort of a sin, a failure of self-regulation. And at the other end of the extreme, um, we also talk about how um, the environment can contribute to obesity. Food deserts and the lack of um, support, uh, stigma associated with being overweight. Um, those factors can, can contribute to obesity. And so we've run some studies where, um, that are similar in design to the, to the crime um, virus and beast studies, where people read a narrative about obesity and then make some judgments. And, um, and in this um, study, one judgment that people made was um, about blame. So who deserves blame for, um, for obesity? Um, and we had people answer questions that were related to individual blame and um, societal blame, environmental blame. So um, some participants read the, the sin narrative that focused on the individual. Others read um, a narrative that talked about um, overweight as an addiction, sort of a, a medicalization of the problem. Um, a disorder narrative was sort of similar to that one. And at the other extreme was the environmental um, narrative. And, um, and what we see in this plot is that after reading a narrative that emphasizes personal failure, people are, are happy to assign a lot of blame to an individual for being overweight. And they don't think the environment plays a big role. At the end, other end of the extreme, People who read about some of the um, societal and environmental causes of, um, of obesity um, are showing the opposite pattern. So they're happy to attribute um, blame to the environment and um, are much um, more forgiving to an individual. In this study, we also asked people um, about their support for public policies designed to reduce the prevalence of obesity. And we looked at policies that were more protective, so um, education campaigns, um, treatment programs, as well as policies that were more punitive, so um, allowing insurers to charge higher premiums for people um, who are overweight, for example. And, um, 
And what we find is that this, um, this measure of blame, how people are thinking about who deserves blame for this problem, tracks um, almost, almost perfectly onto how they're thinking about these treatment programs. Sorry that this graph is a little bit tricky to see, but what it basically says is that um, the more that, that we blame an individual for um, being overweight, the more we support punitive policies. And the more that we recognize the environmental factors that contribute to obesity, the more we support um, protective policies. And there's a growing stock of evidence. Lots of experiments um, now are showing the power of language to shape the way that we see the world. So um, one very um, positive line of work, um, in my opinion, is uh, work by Carol Dweck showing that um, talking about intelligence as something that's malleable, something that can grow, um, can really change students' thinking about um, education and, and, uh, and the role of hard work and practice in education. Um, there's um, a lot of issues, so addiction, a lot, some of uh, the problems that I talked about in the context of obesity also apply to addiction. It's a stigmatized health issue. And talking about it as a disease has a really profound um, effect on how people think about addiction. Reduces stigma, um, encourages people to, to get help if they need it. Talking about cancer as an enemy in a war um, has become a, a topic that's, that's garnered a lot of research interest recently. So, um, and there's trade-offs associated with this metaphor. So on the one hand, it seems to be very effective at raising money and, and grabbing our attention, and that's important. It's a really emotionally salient metaphor. War is, um, is a salient attention-grabbing topic. But it, it's, um, as Susan Sontag sort of um, talked about in her, in her book, um, and in, this is supported by, by our research, it can leave people um, with um, cancer feeling sort of marginalized. If cancer is a, an enemy in a war and, and the doctor is the, the person fighting that war, then the person with cancer is just sort of a battlefield and nobody really wants to be a battlefield. Um, and the last uh, experiment is a little bit raw, so um, I won't go into it in too much detail, but um, talking about immigration as a contamination in the nation's body has really negative effects on how we view immigration. And that's become a, a pretty prevalent framing recently. So, um, so language shapes what we see. It's not just um, a tool for describing reality. It's also a tool for thinking, and it affects the way that we think. How does language shape perception? That's the main focus of my lab. And I'll just talk about a few mechanisms here. So metaphors and narratives and even stereotypes, um, a big part of their function um, is that they ground the novel in familiar terms. And this is um, basically the process of categorization. So if I see an animal in the world and somebody tells me, and it, maybe I've never seen it before and it sort of looks kind of new, and somebody tells me it's a bird, well, then I can make a variety of inferences about what that animal can do. And met metaphors, stereotypes, narratives are culturally salient, um, familiar abstractions, like, um, like bird categories or tree categories in some sense. They help us simplify um, and understand complexity. So when... Um, when we talk about crime as a beast or crime as a virus, we're leveraging what we know about how to solve comparatively simple problems um, for the purpose of thinking about these more complex ones. So a beast problem is fairly straightforward. If there's a lion that's escaped from the zoo and it's terrorizing a city, well, we need to capture that lion and contain it. If we have a crime epidemic in a community, um, we're not gonna capture and contain that crime epidemic. We need to diagnose and treat that problem. And so there's, there's structure to these metaphors and to these narratives. And when we um, use them to talk about novel situations, 
complex socio-political issues, we're leveraging that structure. So one of the, the functions of language is to, is to ground um, novel experiences in familiar terms. And um, another is, um, is that language guides our attention. It shapes what we, um, what we see. It shapes the process of making meaning. So in this um, description of a crime problem that I started with, there's a lot of ambiguous phrases. So we're talking about how Addison didn't have any obvious vulnerabilities um, and how um, in the past five years, the city's defense systems have weakened. And those phrases um, aren't necessarily calling out anything in particular. They're kind of vague. So what do they really mean? Um, what does it mean? What, is it, what makes a city vulnerable to crime? Um, what does it mean to say the defense systems in a city have weakened? And what we're finding is that, um, is that it really depends on the context in which they're used. So um, when a beast metaphor starts this paragraph, people call to mind um, the police force and the criminal justice system. That's what it means to make a city vulnerable to crime, a weak police force and a bad criminal justice system. But if people have just read a virus metaphor, um, the ambiguity in these phrases is resolved differently. People are thinking about poverty. They're thinking about infrastructure. They're thinking about education. And so, um, and so the way that we're talking about, um, about problems is, is having a direct influence on those problems, but it's also shaping how we seek out other information and how we interpret other um, parts of the world how we resolve that ambiguity. Um, and in a follow-up experiment, um, one of the ways that we've tested that particular um, interpretation is just by moving the metaphor frame from the beginning of the report to the end. And in that situation, we don't get any metaphor framing effect. So when the metaphors are at the beginning of the report, we see um, people who read that crime as a beast are more enforcement oriented. Um, but when those um, phrases are presented at the end, um, there's no difference. When people have already resolved these ambiguities without the help of, of these metaphoric labels, um, priming them to think in one way or another, um, the metaphors presented at the end aren't, aren't reshaping and reconfiguring those, um, those mental representations. So, um, so language guides our attention. Language also evokes emotion. And Loftus and Palmer's work illustrates that really nicely. So um, the verb smashed is just much more um, emotionally salient than the word contacted. And that, um, and that leads people to, um, to give higher speed estimates in that task. And, um, and the last point that I want to make about um, how language shapes um, the way that we think is that this process is often unconscious. So both in the production side and on the, um, on the comprehension side. In, um, in the studies that we've conducted on crime, um, in, some of the con in some of the versions, we would ask people afterwards to identify the part of the report that was most influential in, um, in their subsequent judgment. So underline the part of the report that, that led you to give your suggestion. And people would typically identify numeric information. They thought they were being really objective. Um, only about 5% of participants would identify the metaphor as having any, any influence at all in the way that they were thinking. So it wasn't a particularly salient feature of the report. In follow-up studies, we would ask a more targeted question. So we would ask people um, at the end of the study if they could remember which metaphor they got. And about half could remember and about half um, didn't. And then we looked at whether we saw these framing effects among both groups. So, um, so we might expect to see the framing effect among everybody who remembered the metaphor and maybe they're using the metaphor actively to think about these problems. Um, but if people, um, 
forgot the metaphor, it's really unlikely that they were actively using it to think about the problems because we just, we asked this question just sort of a minute later. And, um, and what we find is, is the metaphor framing effect among both groups. So people who remember the metaphor are, are showing an effect of the metaphor and people who don't are also showing the effect of the metaphor. So, um, so at least in some circumstances, um, we feel like we have pretty good evidence that people aren't aware of the influence of language um, on the way that they're thinking. What about um, the capacity for language to, to stigmatize and to build compassion? So um, at a cognitive level, stigma communication um, creates simple categories, us versus them, and it assigns blame to them. It evokes um, negative emotions, disgust, anger, fear, and, um, and it has real effects on people. Um, it generates negative attitudes. It isolates um, the groups and individuals who are stigmatized. On the other end of the spectrum, um, empathic communication at a cognitive level um, typically situates a problem in a broader, more complex ecosystem. Um, it evokes more neutral or positive associations, and it, um, and it engenders compassionate attitudes, um, connecting individuals and groups. So um, to conclude, language is a window into the world. It's um, our primary source of information about lots of really important socio-political problems. Um, it shapes what we see. It's not just a tool for describing our experience of the world or describing what we're thinking. Um, it actually meddles in the thinking process, in the perception process. And it does this by grounding novelty in familiar terms, um, guiding our attention, and activating emotion, often unconsciously, which highlights the stigmatizing and empathic potential of language. Thank you. <laughs> so, so now we will all watch what we're saying <laughs> we know the power of language thank you so much paul um so our next and final speaker is dr holly niseth brem who's a sociologist who has studied reconciliation in post-genocide rwanda she's going to provide an applied example in the context of post-genocide and the role that language has played in reconciliation on stigma and against those who have faced justice so please join me in welcoming holly All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here, and thank you so much to USIP for coordinating this fantastic event. Uh, as I'm sure you're all very well aware, during the 1994 genocide in Rwanda, hundreds of thousands of civilians essentially took up arms against their neighbors. They grabbed machetes and clubs, and they went out to hunt Tutsi. And throughout this, upwards of one million people were killed, and about 250,000 people were raped in about three months. In the aftermath of this horrific genocide, the government of Rwanda held people accountable by creating a localized justice system I'll tell you more about shortly. As you see in this photo, this meant that essentially Rwanda's incarceration rate soared in the aftermath of the genocide. Since then, people have steadily been returning home. Almost always, they return to the same communities where they committed violence, and sometimes they return to the same village as their victims' families. The research project that I'm going to be telling you about is looking at this reentry and reintegration experience. And as was mentioned, I was asked to talk particularly about this as a case study. So just to contextualize it so you know the broader study, the study is seeking to identify three core questions. As you see up here, first, how do we theorize reentry and reintegration in the context of genocide? Second, what obstacles do people convicted of genocide face as they re-enter society? And then lastly, but very importantly, what are the individual, family, community, and state-level factors associated with successful reintegration? Of course, today, I cannot tell you about all of this. Uh, instead, what I'm going to do in the next 13 minutes is this. 
I'm going to start by telling you briefly about one of the core theories that guides this project, one of many, and I'm happy to talk more during our uh, limited discussion afterwards about the other theoretical frameworks. Then I'll tell you very briefly about the context of Rwanda and about my methods. But just to preview that, essentially I've been following 200 people as they've left prison and returned to their communities. And I've also interviewed about 100 Rwandans about what they think about this reentry and reintegration. And we'll be going back to Rwanda in September to continue these interviews. Then I'm going to talk about three core insights as relevant to language, so essentially as relevant to our discussion today. And then I will conclude with broader implications in particular. As you'll note, I have notes because I'm going to try very hard to uh, stay with my 15 minute limit. If I'm speaking too fast, please just feel free to raise your hand. I'm going to try to get through this so we do have time for Q&A as well. So to begin then, uh, I am a sociologist and a criminologist. And the good news is that criminologists have been studying reentry and reintegration for decades. Of course, it's important to note that political and biased crimes like genocide or terrorism are different from other crimes like homicide or rape or burglary, but they do have a lot in common. Because of this, I draw from theories of criminology, and one of the many theories that criminologists use when they look at reentry and reintegration is called labeling theory. Labeling theory essentially posits that labels matter. So how we label ourselves, how other people label us, this can influence not only our self-concepts, but actually our actions and how we interact in the world. So put another way, people's identities and behaviors are influenced by the terms that others use to describe and to classify them. In our case, this is important because people who are labeled as deviants, or particularly terrorists or genocidaires, often face new problems that are associated with this label. In societies that then stigmatize or demonize individuals with these labels, often these individuals face little chance at respect and reentry within mainstream society. And this is in turn important because these individuals can then turn to other communities that will accept them, sometimes violent subcultures. So importantly, as we think about reentry and reintegration, we have to think both about how people label themselves and how they understand themselves and their actions, and about how their communities label them as well. So as I mentioned, I'm looking at this in the case of Rwanda. I should have mentioned this project is funded by the US National Science Foundation, and I have a separate grant from the US National Science Foundation uh, that has basically enabled me to create a data set of all people who were tried for genocide in Rwanda. As you see in the figure here, about 200,000 people were found guilty of participating in the genocide, specifically in violent crimes against people. And about 6% of these individuals were women. You'll see the figure here, if you can read it uh, on the bottom, it's, it's fairly small, but it says category one, category two, and category three. The post-genocide uh, Gachacha court system essentially split crimes into categories. Category one and two were violent crimes against people like genocidal homicide. Uh, and these were met with prison sentences or with sentences in community service camps. Category three, the one where you see the very large bars, these were crimes against property, essentially looting during the genocide. These were not met with prison sentences, but rather with fines that are meant to be reparations. So for this project, I focus specifically on people who were found guilty of category one and category two crimes. As I mentioned, I'm following 200 people as they leave prison. So as I'll talk about in a moment, I first talked with them in prison in 2017, and I've been following them since their release. Of these 200 individuals, 180 were convicted of crimes of genocide. 20 were convicted of other crimes, more ordinary crimes, if you will, like homicide after the genocide. So I have a comparison group. I'm not talking about them today, but I'm happy to talk more about some of the comparisons during our uh, question and answer. As you see here, 19 of these individuals are women, as women did also participate in the genocide. Uh, and their sentences ranged anywhere from eight years to more than 25 years. They are re-entering into communities across Rwanda into both urban and rural communities, importantly. Very briefly, I am talking with these individuals at set times. So as I mentioned, I talked with them before they left prison to learn about their prison experience, why they did what they did, how they expected reentry to go. Uh, and then I've been finding them typically at their homes, but sometimes at a neutral location if they don't want me coming to their homes, uh, six months, one year, and two years after their reentry and reintegration. I'm currently at the one year mark uh, in particular. And as I mentioned at the outset, I'm also talking with community members. So when I began this project, 
project, I interviewed 100 people about what they thought about these people coming back to their neighborhoods. Uh, and as I mentioned, when I go back in September, I will also be talking with people again. It's important to note that there's been a little bit of attrition. Uh, interestingly, in the ordinary crimes comparison group, three people have recidivated and are back in prison. None of the people who have left prison for crimes of genocide are actually back in prison. An important point that I'm happy to return to later as well. So what I'd like to do uh, with my remaining time is to tell you about three core insights that are relevant to our discussion today. As you see here, the first is specifically how the people I'm talking with talk about themselves. How do they label themselves and how do they talk about the violence that they committed? The second then is how their communities are talking about them. How do they label these individuals and talk about the violence they committed? And the third is a really important point about social factors that shape these narratives and shape the reintegration experiences of everyone in this study. To begin then with how people label themselves, if terms like reintegration and reentry are actually meaningful terms, they presumably are going to involve more than someone just physically relocating back to their community, but actually some aspect of symbolic moral inclusion. When people return to society, often this means that they have some type of rites of passage. And a rite of passage is basically a ritual that signifies a change in state or an age or something important in someone's lifespan. These are remarkably consistent across cultures worldwide. You can think, for instance, of bachelor parties, graduation parties, events and rituals that basically mark some kind of transition. When you think about people who are reintegrating following violent extremism, you might think that these are particularly important because they allow someone to have a clear break from their prior life and a clear re-entry into their community. And indeed, this is what I have found for some individuals in Rwanda. So some of the individuals that I've talked with have told me about how when they come home, they were met with a family dinner, community members came over and, and just welcomed them back. Many people have purposefully been given space at meetings to talk about what they did, why they did it, take responsibility, express forgiveness and remorse, and talk about how they look forward to moving on. Just a couple of examples. One person talking about re-entering said, it was a joy, it was a celebratory moment, and people were happy and were very supportive. They brought maize flour for making porridge, so they were really, they were supportive, and this was a sign that they were happy to see us back. Another person told me, there are people that I never expected to help or to greet me, and they did it. Neighbors would come with Fanta. Some friends would come and give me small amounts of money. These rites of passage undoubtedly influenced how these individuals were talking about themselves, and this is really important. One person shared, this is an amazing situation beyond comparison to be back, and also it kind of corrected my feeling people hated me. Many people, time and time again, had these narratives of redemption that drew a stark line between who they were during the genocide and in prison and who they are today. You see some of many examples here. I became a citizen again. Many also said I became Rwandan again. You see, I am no longer a genocidaire or I am a new person now. These are important, and they point to a couple of important takeaways. Uh, the first is the importance of first person or person first language. So you see this here. Someone says, I am no longer a genocidaire. While it can be tempting to call individuals who engage in violence a terrorist or genocidaire, many people really struggled with that as it really placed the action before the person. And they said that there is a separation between who they are and their actions. This is tremendously important, and I heard this time and time again, and it also aligns with research on the importance. We have it here in the US where there's been a movement to talk about someone who committed a felony, not a felon or not as an ex-con. This matters, and it mattered in how they were seeing themselves. Many people also shared that they strove to engage in community activities that really align themselves with how they saw themselves. So for instance, they went to church, they went to meetings, they tried to show their neighbors that they were changed, and they also tried to live up to how they were seeing themselves in this change. This is important because it signifies that communities have to have space for people to have this type of interaction in their communities. It might be voting to allow someone to be a protective and member of society, it might be community service, Whatever it is, these communities do actually have to make space for people to be engaging in them and living up to this positive pro-social view of themselves. Turning quickly to some of the community narratives, how these individuals see themselves is undoubtedly influenced by how their communities see them. And interestingly, we've talked already today about the allocation of blame and responsibility. 
Many of the people with whom I've spoken do take responsibility for their actions. But something that's very important to note in Rwanda is that there is also a very complex structural view of what happened during the genocide. So while people do take responsibility, many Rwandans will tell me when they talk about why the genocide happened, they go all the way back to colonialism and they talk about how Belgium essentially created divisions between Rwandan people. They also talk about how local leaders in the government really created a structure in which the genocide was possible, in which they encouraged people to participate and they created fear. This is really important, and again, while it does not necessarily take away the blame, it does allow people to contextualize actions, and importantly, it allows Rwandan communities to understand why people did what they did. This is important because they don't just see individuals as bad people, they can see them as good people who engaged in bad actions, and they can try to understand that these actions were shaped by a confluence of factors, some individual and some motivational, but some certainly shaped by these broader structural factors, and this in turn humanized them as they were coming back. This aligns with Braithwaite's differentiation between the two types of shaming. There is stigma and there's reintegrative shaming. Reintegrative shaming is what we want to be striving towards. This basically reaccepts someone as a member of a law-abiding community. And one of the four core aspects of this is disassociating someone from their actions and recognizing that good people can do terrible things, often based by a confluence of their individual motivations and this powerful social structure. And this is really important in the narratives that we tell about violence, and especially in communities that are accepting people and reintegrating people who engaged in violence. Finally, uh, and I'll try to go particularly brief so we have some time, uh, I want to note that this is not monolithic. So often we talk about reentry and reintegration as if everyone who's doing this is the same. This is not the case, and as a sociologist, it's really important to note that your social location, so your age, your gender, your SES, your ethnicity, this all shapes your experiences and it all shapes how people view you. In the case of Rwanda, please allow me to make two quick points and two examples here. Uh, the first is SES, or socioeconomic status, and related power. As I talk about these experiences that people are having, the people who are being welcomed, the people who talk about this as this great experience, uh, importantly, it's actually the people who are fairly poor during the genocide. These are people who are better able to lay claim to this narrative that there was this really complex structure and that the local leaders were encouraging them to participate. The people who were local leaders within the community do not benefit from this complex narrative, uh, and they are the ones that do not tell me stories of people welcoming them, and they are having a much worse experience re-entering and reintegrating. Perhaps more importantly is gender, in my opinion. The women in my study are frankly doing much worse than the men. Uh, most of the men have spouses, most of the women do not have spouses, and most of the women are far worse off economically. I think this is tied in large part to gendered ideas about who can and should engage in violence. So in Rwanda, just as here and as most places, if not all places in the world, there's often this dominant idea that men are the ones who can engage in violence and that women who do it are somewhat evil or different. If you've all heard of, of the book Mothers, Monsters, Whores, uh, I'd encourage you to check this book out in particular. So in this case, the women are still seen as different, as evil, as bad, and they're not necessarily benefiting uh, from some of these narratives or some of these dominant views within society as well. So to wrap it up and talk about a couple of takeaways, if you're gonna take away something from these 15 minutes. Uh, first, person first language. As I mentioned earlier, it's tremendously important, albeit a little clunky, to talk about someone who engages in terrorism rather than terrorist, or someone who engages in genocide rather than a genocidaire. I've heard this straight from the people who tell me that this hurts them on a daily basis in Rwanda when someone still calls them a perpetrator or a genocidaire and they're trying to disassociate themselves from this. Second, rites of passage and reintegration markers. It's important to mark these transitions. We have a lot of markers when people leave society, when they integrate into a violent extremist group, when they enter prison that really mark this transition, but we often fail to have markers at the other side. And many of the people in my study have told me that some of these small markers, whether it's a, a couple of uh, Rwandan francs or a fanta, really do something to actually help them feel like there has been a transition. The third point that structural narratives of violence can humanize people is tremendously important. And again, I have the caveat here that this doesn't take away their blame, but it does situate their actions within a broader social structure, a structure that we know is very powerful and that exerts a lot of influence on individuals.
Uh, and then finally, that reintegration experiences will vary by social location. So again, just a reminder that as we think about programs that aid reentry and reintegration, we have to be thinking about how individual differences, their gender, their socioeconomic status, their age, their ethnicity, are going to shape how they view themselves and how others view them in a variety of ways. And we must keep this in mind as we design programs. So with that, thank you so much, and I look forward to our discussion. Well, thank you so much to everyone. Um, this was an incredibly information and content filled um, hour plus, uh, hour and a half plus. So we don't have as much time for question and answers as we originally had hoped. And so I am going to abdicate my moderator's prerogative by asking the first one and instead go to three questions quickly from the audience. I will ask that people quickly identify themselves and please limit it to a question. If it is a comment, I suggest that you speak to our speakers afterwards for commentary. So please, we're looking forward to questions. Yes. Um, this is really, I'm just asking one of Paul, so all of you can answer it. And it's, Paul, this, you know, you're outside of your lane here. So given what you've heard, as we think about how we reintegrate people who've committed crimes in this country, in your part of Ohio even, what have you heard today that you think would make the most sense guiding professional peace builders as we go forward? Thank you. Other questions? We're gonna try and take three. Yes. So go ahead. Um, in terms of uh, reintegration programming, what would you say, I think this is for Dr. Holly probably most pertinently, um, what would you say the biggest differences are in the programming from um, uh, criminal justice reentry programs, particularly for gang members or other violent offenders? What are the biggest differences between um, from people coming from this context? Thank you. And is there a third? Is this, okay, cool. Um, so, yes, I definitely feel, just want to acknowledge that I do feel a little bit out of my lane. Um, <laughs> and um, and, and uh, in terms of thinking about specific sort of language in this domain about how people are reintegrated in society um, and the kinds of language to use, I don't, I don't know if I have a specific suggestion, but a lot of my work um, points to a to a basic distinction between language and metaphors and narratives that are simplifying. So um, the beast example uh, for crime is a really simplifying metaphor. It it makes things fairly straightforward, black and white, um, and the the solution is very clear. Versus more systemic metaphors, metaphors that situate a broader um, a broader problem in a in a context. And so I think the the one of the takeaway points from from the work that I've been doing related um, that relates here is, um, is is to think about that distinction. Really situating a context is 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 critical. Um, a couple of things uh, for the. For the first question that was directed at Paul, I'll, I'll probably just add that I think in the US, uh, this, this complex narrative of the structural factors of crime, I think, could be recognized in the US as well. We know that people who engage in crime in the US are, are not just acting based on their individual motivations. We know that the communities they're in matter. We know that a host of other factors shape this. But often, we don't talk about that when we're talking about the individuals, and we just bring it back to the individuals. So whether or not the Rwandan government intended to do this when they talked about the genocide, I'm not sure. But they did create this complex narrative that did recognize that it, it really is this interplay, and I think that we could learn uh, from that. For the differences for reintegration programming in, in Rwanda versus those of gang members, if I've understood the uh, question correctly. Uh, a couple of things. I must admit I'm not an expert on reintegration here uh, in particular, but some of the differences in Rwanda that I think have been striking, uh, one is that they're also preparing the communities for people to reenter. Often when we talk about reentry and reintegration and we study it as criminologists here, 
we're mostly still focusing on the individuals, but not on what the communities think of reentry and reintegration. And then Rwanda, in large part, I believe, because of the, the massive level of the reentry and reintegration, they also took the step to prepare community members to talk about the fact that people would be coming home, to talk about what drove them to do what they did. And I think this is a large part about uh, why this reentry and reintegration is, at least in part, working. I, I think this could be adopted in the US. I've heard of several programs that have done something similar, but in terms of the criminological research I know, there's not as much that really looks at the community. One other key difference in the US that I didn't highlight much in, in the talk would be the importance of jobs. So in the Rwandan context, most individuals uh, have a fairly agrarian lifestyle. We know that in the US context, when people leave prison, when they leave any situation that left them away from their community, that having a job is particularly important. Of course, for their socioeconomic status, but also to help them feel like they're a productive member of society. So programs in the US in particular that emphasize the importance of jobs are really important, whereas in Rwanda, this frankly hasn't been as important just because most folks are farmers on their own land, so I'm focusing instead on some of the other factors, uh, but would be, be remiss if I didn't mention the importance of jobs and, and similar uh, factors in the US. Thanks so much. We'll take two more first. Thank you, um, panelists. My name is Kyle Dietrich from Equal Access International. I'll forego the comment uh, because of time, but so do you have, I guess Dr. Kuglansky, Shannon as well, anybody who's involved in kind of in this space, I, I'm curious, examples, I mean, our research identifies critical significance, belonging, um, all, all of these things, agency as critical factors. So if those are critical to engagement, and I, appreci I appreciate the, the framing around disengagement and not de-radicalization because they're different processes, what examples do you have of effective programs that work to reintegrate or rehabilitate what we call off-ramping individuals that also are asset-based, right? That still tap into that need for significance, agency, belonging, et cetera. And so we're not stripping away those critical pieces that led them into this radicalization journey that are potentially valuable for, for social transformation. We're just taking away the violence and the chosen path. We're going to take a couple questions. Thank you. Hello, um, Alex Snyder with the State Department. Um, one of the areas that we talk about trying to change the stigma is actually with governments themselves as we're trying to reform, so as opposed to individuals, sort of government actors, whether we're talking about police officers, military officials, governments themselves, as they're trying to reverse this history of being seen as, you know, predation, um, not delivering service. I'm curious if you have any specific guidance or suggestions for changing the stigma and the narrative in that sphere. Hi, Charlotte Kamen, I'm with Navanti Group. Um, some of you mentioned um, the use of counter-messaging to um, effectively take people who are already on this radicalization process um, and kind of steer them away from that path. But for um, some of you who mentioned, what do you do when there's no other place to go and you're already on that path? Can you speak to the effectiveness of counter-messaging or some of the strategies um, behind it to, to veer people in a different direction? I'll take that group and then maybe take one more. The importance of the need for significance is uh, great in, in the process of deradicalization. And in the examples that I know, for example, the Sri Lanka example of LTTE, uh, the program equipped individuals with alternative means to significance through vocational training, uh, through a, a, in a variety of domains, through a, they endowed them with significance and a, a show them a way of integrating into society uh, through professional activity that are alternative to violence. That said, one must not under, uh, underestimate uh, the importance of violence as a primordial means of gaining significance. So, for example, uh, one individual who was well integrated, he worked as a translator, was providing for his family. We asked him, how do you feel now that you have integrated? He said, I feel okay, but I felt better as a fighter. I mean, there is something about, you know, dominance that, that you know, pervades the evolutionary world. Animals do it, 
uh, little children do it, sophisticated nations do it. There's something about violence that really requires a lot of effort to counteract through alternative means. But these alternative means uh, of professional activity and embracement by the community, the kind of uh, integration that Holly talked about, uh, are critical. If, if, if uh, you're integrated in a community, the community supports this alternative means of significance, uh, this is, is likely to, uh, to be effective. And I mean, programmatically in America, it doesn't really exist. So, like, I mean, that there are that there are NGOs out there and individual uh, people out there out doing doing uh, the work of disengagement and reintegration. But I mean, we don't have like an exit program uh, in in any real sense of the word. Um, and in in terms of uh, counter messaging. Uh, I was just, I, I just did some work with uh, one of the tech companies and uh, working on, on some, uh, trying to identify in, uh, some counter messages that, that are out there um, that might be effective. And I think one of the things, I think it can be effective um, at particular, at particular points, if you very simplistically look at the trajectory of radicalization is sort of like a parabola um, that most of our efforts are always like focused on the vertex which is actually what I believe to be the most difficult time to actually get somebody to disengage um, so for counter messaging to be important it has to number one have um, it has to legitimize the grievances that are already being felt uh, by the people who uh, are beginning to delve into uh, their radicalization process. Um, lots of the material that's out there, particularly in terms of like the extreme right wing white nationalist space, does not legitimize the grievances that young white men in particular in this country are al already feeling. Um, it just blows them off. So it, it misses completely. The other thing is that it has to hit its target demographic. If we're all just, you know, I mean, I'm a middle-aged white woman. I have no business being on TikTok. <laughs> but there's counter, there, there's counter content that can be hyper effective there because that is where young people are. That is where that that the bad actors are utilizing these spaces extraordinarily effectively to spread their messaging. So we have to make sure that the content that we are putting out is hitting the demographic where and how um, they are consuming the materials in the first place. And it has to offer, and this is where counter messaging goes terribly wrong, um, it has to offer an alternative pathway. There has to, it can't just be like being a Nazi's bad. Like, well, we all know that. Well, most, most of us know that. Um, but it doesn't give them anything else to do to deal with the grievances that they have, to find the meaning and the sense of community and a sense of agency that they have. And so I think counter-messaging counter can, in fact, be very effective at particular points along the trajectory, um, but that it misses its mark overwhelmingly. I want to also add to the counter-messaging issue uh, counter messaging would not be effective if it's disjointed with the ge general elements of uh, radicalization. Uh, as Shannon pointed out, if the counter messaging is insulting the individual, labeling them uh, in a way that would be uh, derogatory, that's going to miss the point. Uh, if the counter messaging is uh, uh, devoid from the uh, support of the network, it's going to miss the point. So counter messaging has to be integrated with the other element. It has to address the need, f uh, identify alternative means of, uh, of uh, significance, of, of fulfilling that basic motivation. <clears throat> and it has to be validated by a group. Uh, if you address the counter messaging at the individual, uh, whereas the group remains untouched, the individual will quickly, quickly revert 
to the old way of thinking because uh, individuals are uh, embedded in groups and the groups are the epistemic authorities for their beliefs and worldviews. So it has to, uh, the, uh, the counter messaging has to be integrated with the whole uh, panoply of factors that, that create uh, radicalization. Otherwise, it's likely to be uh, ineffective. Uh, uh, just one example, <clears throat> an attempt to de-radicalize individuals through a very complex theological arguments was ineffective because people who are radicals, they, they don't really uh, care about the theological intricacies. They care about their needs of becoming heroes. And the narrative is, is just a, a crutch, it's just a rationalization for, for you know, uh, fulfilling their motivation. So it has to be, as I, I pointed out, uh, integrated, it has to address people's motivation, it has to be validated. Just a couple of other things to add then. Uh, on the counter-messaging point, um, this is not my area, but I would like to just briefly point out that the messages that people receive and the different types of, of violence we're talking about is quite different or can be quite different. So in the case I talked about uh, genocide, actually the average age of someone who participated at the time was 34, which is much older than a lot of the ages that you're gonna see for people who do participate in violent extremism. And this is important because in Rwanda, participation in the violence was framed as a way to stand up and to protect their families and their communities. So this is a very different message that people might be getting in other circumstances. So I just want to add a note to pay particular attention to the types of messaging that people are receiving because this is going to vary whether it's terrorism or genocide or a different type of crime. Uh, on the question about governments, uh, I must admit I don't have a great answer, but I, I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, as I mentioned, in Rwanda, the local leaders who were part of the government are not having great reentry and reintegration experiences. And I think this is in part because this dominant narrative of the violence really does not talk about the structural factors that were at play for them, but really places a lot of the blame for the genocide on them. I do think that sociologists of organization could tell you that bureaucratic structures are tremendously powerful as well, so there is space to talk about the different structural factors that shape leaders' actions or shape the actions of police people or others who were engaged in the violence. Uh, the other thing I'll note about the case of Rwanda is that they made a concerted effort to involve police, to involve members of the government in the transitional justice process. And many of the people that I spoke with in the aftermath of the genocide said that they didn't trust the government at first, but then they were able to engage with people at a more local level within their community, and that this helped them to regain some of the trust in the government. To add on the, on the government point, um, it, one of the things that, that struck me as important related to that is, is sort of a leadership issue. So if, if, if the leadership really believes in the government and the power of the government uh, to affect change and, and do good, I, you're not fighting such an uphill battle and it seems like, like there is a big uphill battle to fight right now. Um, in terms of the, of the language, I could certainly imagine narratives um, that emphasize the, the, the relationship between the people and, and the government and, um, and government organizations and how government organizations really are just people, representatives of, of, um, of a country. And, um, and emphasizing that could potentially break down some of these us versus them barriers. So I was going to take another round of questions, but I recognize we're already over time. So I'm going to take this opportunity to, uh, first of all, thank my incredible team here at USIP, starting with Chris Bosley, Michael Darden, and Desmond Jordan, whose brainchild this event was and have brought it together seamlessly. And um, so thank you so much for all of the hard work you've put into this. And second, thanks to all of my incredible experts that have joined us today who have imparted incredible amounts of knowledge and information for those of us who are working on violent extremism every single day. We have lessons in cross-comparative studies that we need to be bringing to bear into this wicked problem, so thank you. Um, and on behalf of USIP, thank you for everyone who has joined today and look forward to participating more in the future. Thank you.